Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. My name is Thomas. I'm the producer of this podcast, and it's been a few weeks. We are back, though. We're back on our Pillars of Faith series, where we're talking about the main pillars of the Christian faith, the theology behind these pillars, uh, just the main stuff, the, the, the core things that make a Christian a Christian. And this week, Keith is sitting down back with Kevin, and they're going to have a conversation about the church. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode on the church. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Keith. How you doing? I'm good. I'm glad to be back. Glad you're back today as we are continuing on our pillars of faith. Mm -hmm. And today we get to talk about the church. Yeah. As I thought about that, I thought, this is a really straightforward, simple thing. It's that building you go to on Sunday mornings yep. and processing a little bit more. And of course, some off offline conversation realized, yep. oh, it's actually a little bit more than that. A little so, bit. A little um, bit more. So I'm excited about this. I think yeah. that this could be a, a neat topic for us yeah. to talk about. Yeah, So I too. what does the church mean if it's not that building you go to on Sunday mornings? Yeah, in, in the ancient world, uh, there was a... a in the ancient Greek world, which is where the church to a large degree began, um, there was the word ecclesia. And the ecclesia was the term that was commonly used for the church. In the New, in the New Testament, it's used 115 times. and But in the ancient world, that was a term used for just a, an assembly, a gathering. And so if a political group gathered, they, they could be hmm. called an ecclesia, a gathering. But the church took that because it, the idea was this is a place or a experience where people with a common vision and heart and passion in this case for the gospel for jesus for for god's word would gather together would assemble so there's it's clearly that something about the church is gathering one of the reasons that i think that this season with that we're kind of at the hopefully at the tail end of with right. covid is that the gathering was disrupted uh yeah we can gather together online but it's different uh and if you would have said something in the ancient world well you know is gathering you know 10 people being in 10 different locations Probably even if not. you could somehow hear each other people say well no it's it's life to life you know heart to heart eye to eye kind of thing and so um so so the word the word ecclesia which is the word we use for church means assembly or gathering right. now you can go a whole lot deeper than that i was th- as i was thinking about this i was thinking about you know where the church gathered but we're also still the church god's people and then we become the church scattered and and the thing is we can't be gathered all the time Right. And we, should, we shouldn't be no. gathered all the time. We're called to be salt and light and be out there in the world. And so you can have the church gathered, you can have the church scattered. And then when you talk about the church, you can have the church universal. And the church universal would be the, the global church. So I say, well, Keith, are you part of a church? And you say, yes. Well, what church? Well, I'm part of Shoreline Church. But you're also part of the church. And that, that would be God's people who will be gathered, gathered one day together in mm-hmm. glory, but right now are scattered all over the world. One of the things I love about Shoreland is that we pray for another ecclesia, another gathering, another assembly every single Sunday, mm-hmm. almost every single Sunday. Uh, sometimes we pray for, you know, for all churches, but there's the church universal, and then there's the church triumphant. And the church triumphant, uh, in, you know, theologians, when they talk about that, that means all the people who are part of God's family who've gone before us. Mm, right. And so it's all the saints, not just capital saint, Catholic church on a, glass window saint but just all those who know jesus and by his grace have been cleansed of their sins um that is also the church uh, triumphant the church throughout all time and so you've got you start very small a local congregation assembly that could be a church of 30 or 40 people or a church of five or six thousand uh then you go to the church scattered then you go to the church universal around the world then the church triumphant all those who've gone before us every every believer through every century until Jesus returns is also his church. So already bigger than just hanging out at Shoreline, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying that there is such thing as a church mm-hmm. and then there is the church. Yeah, yeah. Um, you touched on that a little bit right there. Yeah. If you could define that, how would you define the difference between those two? Yeah, well, you know, a church, um, if, and you could talk about like capital C church, meaning the church universal. Mm-hmm. Uh, small C church or capital is like shoreline church because it's it's you know you're talking about it's a specific congregation right. but the idea is there's there's individual congregations it's not practical uh, for every Christian in the world to gather all together at one time yeah. uh, a little it's difficult ex- 
Travel is very expensive. I mean, you, know, you, you go, well, we should be as unified as possible. You can be unified and not in the same room. Absolutely. Uh, and so uh, so there is a local congregation, a, and we can call that congregation a church, an assembly, a gathering. Absolutely. Uh, there's denominations that would say, well, they're, they're, they're a church. They're, you know, they have mm. a certain kind of brand, and we can talk about that more if you want to. But yeah. there's, there's different kind of... Uh, kind of brands or flavors, but any, any church means that they have certain beliefs and things that they hold to that make them a distinctively Christian church. Uh, so so there, there is a congregation, but then there's also the church, which is the broader universal church. And so most people, if, you know, if somebody says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to church, they're talking about their local congregation. Mm -hmm. If somebody says, I love the church, it usually means something bigger. Yeah. It means a concept of who we are as the body of Christ. I came out of a non-churched background, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where I, uh, I I remember vague recollections of going to church a couple of times as a little kid. Um, it was actually an Episcopal church. That's its own denomination, its own, its own story and history. But uh, my parents went to church because it was the socially appropriate thing to do. Uh, because my dad had been raised kind of loosely around the Episcopal Church. And so, uh, but then I actually, I remember, I, I have a picture in my mind of this really creepy uh, thing with a guy with nails stuck through his arms and like blood running down and like a really spiky thing on his head and blood down his face. I remember as a kid, I mean, that's one of my memories of that that place had that thing. Mm. And then they also had snacks. <laughs> I was a really, I was, I was a really little kid, and so I actually, I, I don't know what, I, I don't know if I was in like nursery or I was in a class. I don't know where my parents had dropped me off, but I just, I just knew that there were snacks somewhere. So I literally snuck out, went to the snack table, which was, uh, you know, I had to kind of climb up to it, mm -hmm. and it was sort of a counter thing that wasn't mounted and 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 locked down. And I climbed up on this thing, thinking it was where cookies were, and it was where there were all kinds of freshly poured cups of coffee. And this whole thing came down yeah, and landed on my that. chest, and all the coffees kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, like a wave came across my chest and my face. And then they took me in an ambulance to the hospital, and that was my last memory of church. And so, uh, but so memorable. For so, sure. I, so yes, I went to church growing up, <laughs> but only kind of in a kind of a strange way. Uh, but, but you know, so I said, well, that I had a, but that wasn't an upbringing in church. That was we went a couple of times, and I, there was no memories of it after. Maybe at a Christmas or an Easter, but I don't, don't remember any of that. Uh, but when I became a follower of Jesus and became, became part of a local church at the time, it was called Garden Grove Community Church. And they had a real heart for the community. They had a real heart for students. They had a, a massive youth ministry. It, the youth room could fit about 600. And they had to do it, the same youth group on Wednesday and Thursday night, the same program with different kids and divide up the region because they had so many kids coming. Wow. They couldn't fit it. There was about a thousand kids that were coming to the youth group. And then I would go over to the, the, the big, big people church service as a new believer and most of my friends did, but I did. And I really loved, I loved, I thought these, are, these people are getting together to, to worship God and love Jesus and they care about each other. And so uh, my entry point into, into a local church was when I was about 16 years old. And I, and I was just uh, immediately enthralled by the concept and thought this was really neat. And I would actually, I would go, because in the mornings I would go to the youth service I'd go back in the evening and go to the, the big people service. And usually I'd go by myself without it, meaning without my friends. And, and I would remember whenever they, at the end of the service, they would say, if you want to come forward and pray for people, you could. And so I would always, whoever the people were around me, usually older people, I'd say, is there anything I can pray for you for? And then I'd go up and they, people would go and kneel in the front on this like marble, really hard. It wasn't very practical. It wasn't like carpeted. It was really hard. But I would go up there and kneel down and pray for these people. And I remember one lady uh, told me she was battling cancer. Mm. And I thought well, it was an amazing, this lady I didn't even know um, and her name was Arvella. And I didn't know at the time that she was the wife of the pastor of this big church. And, uh, but I remember going up there and praying for her and coming back afterwards. And she was really sweet and thanked me for doing that and asked me like, what, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you know, I, I know I'm supposed to go to church and I go in the morning, but that's all people my age. And I don't know if that's really the church. Mm -hmm. I didn't say like I got to be around right. old people or anything, but I but I just said you know, I just felt like it needed to be something bigger than that. So that we all kind of have our own journey. And some people have had really bad experiences in right. the church, but when they say uh, uh, this this church hurt me, they don't mean the church universal, the church right. triumphant. They mean a local congregation, and what they really mean is specific people right. were did not treat them well, and that's because people are broken and sinful, and that's a whole other podcast. Right. We already did that one, right? Yeah, we, we covered true. sin, didn't we, Thomas? Yeah. Did, yeah, go watch that one if you're not sure what <laughs> sin is. So, well. A long time ago, I would say that there were less of the big buildings that we now call the church or a church, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they met in people's homes yep. or in courtyards or in plazas. Yep. Um, 
Do you see those as the same thing today? Because I think there's maybe a, a little bit of a movement even today to, to have ho- churches in people's homes. Does yeah. that yeah. kind of fit the same feel or what, how would you see that being different? Yeah, what I think what makes a church a church isn't so much the size, mm-hmm. uh, it's what happens in terms of community, in terms of uh, learning the Word of God, preaching and teaching and learning the Word of God, in terms of accountability for spiritual growth. There's things that, there's things that kind of make up what it means to be a church, doctrinally what we believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think I think you know in the early yeah, in the first century a lot of the churches were home churches. Um, there's a movement. Um, there's always been a movement of home churches uh, through history. Right now, it's interesting. I I don't think I, I know I know of home churches, but I don't think it's a massive movement. I think some people have been forced to be in their homes with COVID right now. But I don't, and I, I've got friends who are really really are. Or like leaders in that home church movement really I had a guy in my pastor's group for about four years who led the Monterey area primary home church movement and it it felt like it was as he would share with us we would pray from a constant uphill battle right. and it just uh, uh, so so I think I think that it's not the size uh, it's it's what happens it's the God who's there it's worshiping of Jesus keeping our focus on him it's a body surrounded uh, around his mission and purpose and with him as head and Lord and that can be that can be in a group of Thirty people, and that can be a church of thirty thousand people, and and so I don't think that the size is the factor. There are some things that in a very very small church that make it difficult and challenging, and there's some things in a very very large church that make it difficult and challenging, right. and there's some things in a small church that make it easier to be the church, and some things in a large church that make it easier to be the church. So I, I don't think that the size is the factor, uh, but I think it's what the church is about and what we do and what we believe that's the core factor. And would you say that there's like biblical guidelines or biblical boundaries of what makes a church a church? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's I mean that each each one of those could be a pretty big conversation. Sure. But there's some, there's some core things. I would say that the the first thing, if you look and say, is that is that ecclesia? Is that group? Is that assembly of people a Christian church? Uh, I'm gonna the first question I'm gonna ask is not what kind of songs they sing or how do they act or how do they believe? You know, I, I mean, or how do they act? But it, it's gonna be what do they believe? Mm-hmm. Uh, is, the, is there a um, agreed to body of belief that reflects this book, that reflects the Bible? Uh, and so you have groups of people that, you know, a, a group can call themselves a church and they can say, well, I've got an organization, we have a tax exempt status, we're a church. So are you a Christian church? And they say, well, you kind of. And you say, well, okay, well, tell us what you believe. And then you go back to the, to the what, are, what are the pillars of the faith? What are, the, mm-hmm. you know, what, are, what are those core beliefs? So like at Shoreline, I just did a new members class last Sunday. And I had some people on monitors that were online and some people in the room that were gathered together. And um, and I walked through our core beliefs. And I actually said, if you're gonna join Shoreline Church and become a member, and I always remind people in those classes, I tell them, I'm not a salesperson. I don't get commissions. I don't get bonuses. I don't get more money if you join. I said, I, I, I want you to be where God wants you to be, but God wants you to be in a local church and actively engaged. Do you sometimes and, tell them that it might not be us? Oh, I always, tell, I always tell them that. One of my professors in seminary, uh, a guy named C. Peter Wagner, uh, he said he asked the question, when's the best time to, to lose an unhappy church member? Hmm. And they said, before they join. That's <laughs> he a said, good one. He says, find out if they're going to be unhappy. So he says, just be who you are. And, and so I'll, I'll say, you know, if you, I'll say often, if you're looking for a church that's super traditional, I, I, I'll, I'll tell them, theologically, we're Orthodox, we're historical Christian, but stylistically, we're not real traditional. And I'll say, if you, if you want super traditional, if you want pipe organ and all the hymns, uh, I'll say, I know a couple of churches in the area that are doctrinally sound, but that's their style. That's a stylistic thing. Mm-hmm. Other people say, man, I'm looking for a church that is that is super charismatic. Now, what they mean, the word charismatic means uh, filled with the Spirit. Every Christian church is super charismatic because the Spirit's right. there. And this, but what they mean by super charismatic is is like what Thomas grew up in. Is it okay if I say that, Thomas? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, so it's, it's right. Certain expressions, right. certain things. Um, was there was there dancing in your church? Oh, there was there was dancing. Okay, there was dancing. Okay, and there was dancing in the Spirit. I mean, there's there's certain practices that are, and there's going to be um, certain behaviors and patterns that are going to, that's what they mean by that. Um, so I'll, I'll say, you know, Shoreline is very filled with the Spirit. We follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. But if you're looking for certain expressions in the normal church services that are like what you came from, mm-hmm. that's not who we're going to be. And so I know some churches like that, that that believe the Word of God, uh, 
Because right. there's church like that that kind of go off, get skewed right, for sure. well, of every type With of church. With every type, right? right? Yeah. Uh, but there's some that are right on. And so I'll actually say to people, if we're not the right fit, let me know. And I'm very comfortable pointing you to another mm. Bible-believing, you know, gospel-preaching, Jesus-loving, kind Christian church. But you're talking about then about style, mm. not about substance. But when it comes to the substance... And in this new members class, I said, we're going to walk through our core beliefs. And if you don't align with these core beliefs, please don't join this church. Now, we'll meet with you one-on-one with a pastor. We'll talk to you. We'll, we'll try to kind of walk through the scriptures, help you see why we believe, you know, that, that God is one God who exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll help you understand why we believe that salvation comes through the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection, and only through the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. We'll try to help you understand why these, these are core beliefs that I believe make you Christian, mm-hmm. and that without, without those beliefs, you really aren't a Christian church. You might, you might be a gathering, you might be an assembly, right. but are you a Christian church? And so I think the first thing that makes a church a church is that we believe the word of God and we hold to the core beliefs of the Christian faith. Uh, then if you start to study different uh, historical movements and understandings of the church, there'll be things like, you know, right preaching of the word. The scriptures are mm-hmm. preached and taught. Whether the preaching is um, a pastor or an elder or a church member that you're opening up the word of God, you're learning from the scriptures, um, that, there, that there's, uh, some will say, right administration of the sacraments. So that there's baptism, that there's mm-hmm. there's communion. Uh, some, will, some will say you know, that there's appropriate church discipline, which really really means that we have a mutual accountability and there's a closeness enough in the lives of these people that if somebody's wandering from the, the faith or wandering down the wrong path, we will in love seek to restore them. Mm-hmm. And so you can, you, know, you can read books on you know, the marks of the true church and you're gonna have, you can have all kinds of debates about that, but I would say it's right belief, um, it, it's, it's right worship that's, that's focusing on our God, uh, it's focusing on Jesus Christ and glorifying Him. Um, I, I believe it's right preaching and teaching of the word. Uh, it's community and fellowship. We talk about seven markers of spiritual maturity. Those markers become part of how we do life together as Christians. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think I think there's certain things that make a church a church. And then when you have groups that'll say that will take the name church, and now I'll, I'll get in, you know, I'll I'll, I'll bother, I'll, I'll irritate a few people here, but. Um, I, my wife and I wrote a book years ago called Finding a Church You Can Love and Loving the Church You Found. Right. A little book just to help people find the right church, but not just a church that meets their needs, but where they can love that church and pour back mm-hmm. into it. And in that book, we talk about when you're looking for a church, look at their core beliefs and pull up, you know, go online, look at their doctors or go to that church and say, can I, do you have a statement of faith? And if, if, if a church says no statement of faith, you, you, you probably don't want to land there right. because they're not sure what they believe or, or they don't want to tell you what they believe. Sure. And that's, that's, core that's central uh and so um but but in in this book we talked about uh, entire groups that will say we are a church and might maybe even say we're a christian church uh but their core beliefs wouldn't be in line with historical christianity so a a mormon church or a mormon stake this is where mm-hmm. i was gonna get in trouble right. by some people uh people say well mormons are such sweet people they're such nice people i have family that are mormons they're right. sweet people they're not yeah. well they're not all sweet they're not right. all nice but just like not, else, not, right? not everybody in our church are all sweet and nice right um and not everybody in this room is always sweet and nice and i was that, actually that, just <laughs> thinking that exact thing <laughs> and i'm talking about all three of it there's moments where all three of us can be right. sweet and nice and moments that we're not so right. so i'm not judging people's you know their personality or their kindness or even their intent right. but in the mormon church they don't they are not monotheistic they don't believe in right. one god they're polytheistic right. We did a podcast in this pillar series on theology, right? And we talked about different, you know, monotheism, Absolutely. polytheism. Well, Mormons are polytheistic. They believe in many, many gods. They actually believe that we can become gods right. if we follow certain right. things that are that are kind of part of the guidelines of the Mormon doctrine. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if they say, well, we're a Christian church, but we believe in many, many, many gods, I would say no, um, because you believe in many, many, many gods. That, that moves you outside the family of Orthodox Christianity. Mm-hmm. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Right. And some, again, people go, oh, th- what, what? But I have friends that are Jehovah's Witnesses. Fine. Uh, that's, that's fine. But uh, they don't believe that Jesus was divine. Uh, they believe that only Jehovah was divine. And so, again, if you dig down into their theology, you look and say, well, if an Orthodox, when you say a Christian church, do you mean churches that hold to the Orthodox biblical teaching of the faith. You know, could they say the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the three ecumenical creeds, could they say those along with us? And the answer is no. Right. And so, okay, well then, then they're a gathering, they might be mm-hmm. an ecclesia, a gathering, they might be an assembly, uh, they might, they, they may very, very well be religious, but are they Christian? And so what we're talking about here for our purposes, when we say a church, we mean a Bible-believing Christian right. church. And so there's a lot 
involved and what it means to be a church. When we have people join our church, we don't have like 87 core doctrines. Right. We've got about like nine or 10 because they're the core. Uh, and, there's, and, and they're salvific. They're things that have to do with our salvation. But there's other things that we believe, you know, the end times, when Jesus will return, how he'll return, what that will be like, lots of different points of view. And you know what? That's, you're not saved by how you view the second coming of Jesus. You are saved by how you believe, what you believe about the, the life, death, and resurrection of mm -hmm. Jesus. And so there are groups that claim the name church that don't hold to biblical doctrine. I would say they're not a church in the sense that we mean right. by a Bible-believing Christian church or assembly. Yeah. And you mentioned a few minutes ago um, that we say if you can't uh, align with these general beliefs, um, we would say don't join our church. Mm -hmm. But what does that that doesn't mean don't attend our church, does it? What what is the difference yeah. between joining our yeah. church yep. and a, and attending? Yeah. So church membership, which is um, I interesting, in the first century there was a whole what's called a catechetical process where they would do a catechism of people of adult, not kids, adults. Right. If someone said I want to become part of the church, there could be a months and months long process before they could be baptized. I'm talking about early, early, very, very, like very early in the history early. of the church, right? Before they could be baptized, before they could be considered a part of the body formally, mm -hmm. they would have to go through a rigorous doctrinal process of learning, partly because almost every person came out of radical paganism. Mm -hmm. In most of the cities where the, the, the early letters to the churches the Apostle Paul wrote, in most of those cities, they were very um, either polytheistic, many, many, many gods, or um, they were part of the emperor cult where they believed the emperor was God, or they were part of uh, kind of Greco-Roman mythology. I mean, there are all these different, so different you know, philosophies and religious systems, and what the church was saying is, before you become part of this church, you have to understand what you, much of what you believe has been wrong. You have to set that aside and embrace the scriptures. I've had that with some people here at Shoreline who've come out of a very pluralistic background. Where I had one person who, mm. she basically said, well, I, I love Jesus. I think Jesus is wonderful. I want to receive him. But she also wanted to hold on to about seven or eight other religious systems. Mm -hmm. And I pictured in my mind like it was this kind of like the, um, on, a, on a fireplace, what's it called? The, the, uh, the, the, the mantle? Ma a mantle above a fireplace. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got, got all their different little idols and gods and just want to take a little little picture of Jesus and kind of tack add it up on the wall the mix. along with their right. mix. And, it's, and I actually said to that person, I said, Jesus doesn't work that way. He, he loves you so much, he's not going to share you with other Others, especially when those others are false gods and going to be abusive to you, mm. he's going to ask you to come to him alone. And this is why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's lots of, there's lots of um, perspectives out there. And, and so for Shoreline, I would say to a person, if you're ready to embrace the core beliefs, not of Shoreline Church, of the Christian right. Church, you're welcome to become part of the church. If you're not, I, I always say to them, keep coming, keep listening, keep learning. Well, I, I told this group this last Sunday, I said, we will have a pastor meet with any of you that wants to meet and walk through some different things. I had one person that spent about half an hour afterwards and we just talked for about a half an hour about a very specific part of not so much a core doctrinal issue, but kind of a moral issue. They're grappling, they said, how do, you, how do you relate to this? How do you handle this as a church? And uh, they were making sure that they weren't out of bounds with where we stand as a church. Right. Um, and so, and we just had a really good, honest conversation. I, mm -hmm. I, my sense is they're going to probably say, this is a place where I feel at home. They actually said they've been to 12 other churches, never felt at home, walked in here at Shoreline and said, we feel like we're home. Wow. And I said, and so, but they wanted to make sure that their beliefs were aligned, right. uh, which is, which is important. And we don't do like a six month catechetical process. Uh, we do, you know, we do an hour and a half class. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but again, people are, are more people now come in with either no faith or a kind of a marginalized Christian type background that's just kind of needs to be uh, kind of something needs to be clarified. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody comes in from a completely pagan background, they're gonna it's gonna probably be a longer process. They might say, I need some time to just keep attending and talk with the pastor. And we'll do mm -hmm. that with people and walk them down that journey to the point where they either say, "Boy, I don't, I don't embrace this," or "Oh, I get it." Mm -hmm. I, I, I embrace Jesus as the Savior as the only way. I, I embrace the scriptures as true. I am, embrace the, uh, the, you know, the, the person of Jesus as the, the sacrifice for my sins. And, and then they'll align. So when we do a new members class, um, normally there'll be some people right away after the class, they'll just say, hey, I'm joining. And we've got kind of a, a covenant where they'll just say, I affirm these beliefs. This is how I want to seek to live up my faith. And they'll say, I'm, I'm great. Others will take a day or two. Some will take a few weeks. Some will at the end of the time say, yeah, I'm just not there. I'd rather have them be clear about that 
That's I'm just going to jump in because it's a, a club. You think about Absolutely. when you're on your computer and and something pops up and you have to sign, you know, click here to, to sign or whatever. And if you click on it, it'll give you just you know, just scroll, 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 scroll. And it used to be you'd have to scroll way down and then click at the bottom. Right. They don't even do that. They just say no. we know no one's going to read it. Nobody cares about the small print. And what we're saying as a church is for sure is we care about the small print. Right. We care about what people believe. Yeah, every time I fill out a bunch of documents like that that I have to sign, I'm thinking, oh, they're going to probably have one line in there that's going to ruin my credit or is going to you know take my house away. But do you read it anyways? I don't. You don't. <laughs> Wait, what's this part about my firstborn child? <laughs> like, it's just too yeah. much stuff, too yeah. many words. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you you mentioned the the word episcopal. Yeah. You mentioned the word charismatic. Mm-hmm. Gets me thinking through. There's a lot of different expressions within yeah. the church. Can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about all of the not all of the different yeah. expressions, but <laughs> but that there are some different expressions within the church. Yeah. Kinda. Let me do it alphabetically. The Anglican Church. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. There's just uh, if you want to look at a history of division. Heartbreakingly, to study the history of the church, uh, I'm ordained in in a in a church called the Reformed Church. Uh, the Reformed Church was actually the first. It was originally the Dutch Reformed Church uh, that came to the states before the United States was the United States, and uh, and then along the way, a group within the Reformed Church left, and they started the. Christian Reformed Church. As it, you know, it was sort of like a little jab. It You're was, the Reformed yeah, Church, but absolutely. we are the Christian Reformed Church. And a group left them called the Protestant <sighs> Reformed Church. And that's just one, and now this is just one little sliver mm-hmm. of, the, of, of the pie, and these are like little, little uh, nibbles off the slivers of, you know, of the, of, yeah. and so uh, there's a, there's, I think there's something that breaks the heart of God about all of the different, all the differences that we tend to fight about. Mm-hmm. And when my wife was growing up, my wife grew up in the Reformed Church, right? In her community, there was lots of Dutch folks. So there, there were lots of Reformed churches and lots of Christian Reformed churches. And there are not two groups of Christians more similar than the Reformed Church and the Christian Reformed Church. In heritage, in names, in family background, in core doctrines, they both followed the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgic Confessions, the the, the Canons of the Synod of Dort. These aren't things I get to talk about much. At, uh, but you should all look these things yeah. up. No, nah, <laughs> no, nah, don't. Uh, but uh, but they, but they, they, all, all these you know, statements of faith and all these doctrines and different, and they have them all in common. Right. But what divide? What the three things that, that ended up causing that big rift were things like. Uh, there were people in the Reformed Church who are part of, of assemblies and lodges. And the group that left, the Christian Reformed Church, said, you cannot be a Christian and be in our church and be part of like a lodge or a, one of those groups. The Reformed Church people said, we're, we, we're kind of ambivalent. You know, we, we, we wouldn't want to be inappropriate, but if you wanted to be, you could. So mm-hmm. one thing was, was lodges. Another thing was private schools. The group that left was more, was more, I think, a little more heavy-handed. They said, you have to have your kids, basically have your kids in Christian schools. And the people in the Reformed Church said, well, your kids could be in Christian schools, but if they're in public schools, that's okay. And, uh, and then the thir- a third element was a part of worship. The group that left said, you have to preach every week from the Heidelberg Catechism, the biblical text right. from the Heidelberg Catechism. And the group that was the Reformed Church said, we use the Heidelberg Catechism, and we also use like the Psalter Hymnal, but we don't have to use it every single week. So the group that left said, no, you have to use the hymnal and you have to use, you have to do the catechism every week. No, you cannot be in a lodge. Uh, yes, you, there, there was just, you, it was stricter, right? Mm-hmm. But if you talk to those people, their core beliefs were the same and their peripheral beliefs were almost all the same, but there were a few differences. This divided this group and um, literally people in my wife's generation as a kid and before for almost a hundred years in that area, if you had a young guy from the Reformed Church and a young girl from the Christian Reformed Church who met each other, hard to do because they went to separate churches, right. they went to separate schools, there was a lot of separation there. But if, and they fell in love. It was like a Romeo and Juliet. These are like Romeo these were like Juliet. these are like gangs. You know, was, this is West Side Story. I can do it. Da 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 da. Should I keep going, Thomas? Because I can. Um, oh. And so uh, I got music in my. Uh, We'll have, whole, to, we'll have whole, to get the uh, the copyright right. I've 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 had, I've had counts. I've had count. I've, but I, I my family was big into musicals. Mm-hmm. I've seen too many musicals and too many shows. But anyways, it, but there, it was like the, like this battle, and you had to, parents go, "We cannot support you marrying another Christian from another Reformed background who believes almost everything you believe, 
But this would be like you're like you're losing your faith if you would actually wow. that it got that bad. That's crazy. That's that's now now that's like one sliver of tons of tons of heartbreaking examples of how we divide. Those divisions are are oftentimes not about core beliefs. They're about stylistic things. They're about control. That one would seem to be the group that the group that slivered off and left were were a little bit more strict in saying you have to, you must, you can't. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden, then the other group that wasn't as strict, they're liberal. And that's, um, and so, and very interestingly right now, uh, this, in the next three to four months, the Reformed Church will split again. Hmm. Because there's, because there's leaders in the Reformed Church now who have embraced things that I think actually do start to question some of the core beliefs of faith. So there's a whole group leaving the Reformed Church called the Ark. Think like an arc to, to, to the Association of Reformed Churches, and that group is now leaving, and then a bunch of individual churches are splintering off, and we're not even sure if the actual Reformed Church in America will have the strength to even exist after that happens. We'll see. So, um, so, so some of the reason there's so many different things is just differences, disagreements, uh, human nature of just standing strong on what I believe and what I think. I think there's some times where, the, where those breaks happen where it's actually a thing where you look and go, no, this is about a core doctrinal thing and this needs to happen. Right. There's other times where it's really very much style. Uh, and then in the history of denominations, you have to, well, you know, there's Lutheran churches and there's Episcopal and then there's Catholic churches and there's Orthodox churches. If you've never worshipped in an Orthodox church, it's fascinating. Uh, when you, there, There's a, a massive icon of Jesus on the ceiling above you looking down, it's actually Jesus coming back in judgment. And that's what's over you in church. And then there, up in the front, there's, it's fascinating. The, the senses, there's incense and there's, uh, these two, these two uh, kind of doors called the angel doors, uh, mm -hmm. Michael and Gabriel, I think it is, uh, and there's priests kind of coming and going. It's really, it's, it's fascinating. There's a lot of activity. There. A lot of activity, uh, a lot yeah, going on. Yeah. Uh, and so, to me, whether you're whether you're Orthodox or whether you're Catholic or whether you're Lutheran or Baptist or Independent, uh, whether you're Charismatic, uh, the question it, it's going to always to me to come back to the core doctrine. Do you believe the core beliefs that the Bible teaches about what it means to be a Christian? Hmm. And after that, it becomes stylistic issues. It becomes now now there's there's extra teaching that gets layered on. The Catholic Church particularly has like a whole body of teaching that some people will, they might lean more towards the teaching of the church than towards the teaching of scripture. To me, that's not just a Catholic thing, it's any church. If the teaching of your your own denomination's history or beliefs becomes more important than the scriptures mm -hmm. and the human teaching becomes the filter by which you read the scriptures, you have a problem. The scriptures have to become the filter and the guidelines by which you read all of your church doctrines. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, knotted up massive hairy ball of of uh, of splits and tensions and conflicts and even through history, there's times where uh, the way that the reformed and Christian reformed people treated each other. Sometimes the kids would even like walk home from school on the opposite sides of the street. They weren't supposed to be on cross the street, literally mm -hmm. literally cross the street to connect with each other. Um, but that's child's play right. compared to times in history where you had, you had groups that were that were persecuting each other. And calling each other heretics, mm -hmm. and uh, and and doing worse to one another. You go, boy, that's, and that's a that's an issue of, of the human heart, and, and that reminds us why we need the grace of Jesus. Yeah. And I, I love that today. There's more and more, I think, more and more Christians that are that are uniting around the things that can unite us, and spending less time fighting about the things that divide us. If there are things that are core salvation issues, then I say then we have to stand our ground. Right. If they're peripheral issues, um, you know, major on the majors and minor mm -hmm. on the minors. Yeah. As you were talking, it took me back to seminary when I had a, a semester-long class of just the history of the church in the United mm -hmm. States, yeah. and we scraped the surface of it for a semester. Yeah. Um, there's so much in there. Yeah. Um, and then when we talk about going all the way back to like how the church was formed, mm -hmm. uh, would you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah. Obviously, we've had a lot of history and lots of denominational yeah. things more recently, but yeah. But we all kind of go back to the same beginning yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. And and history is always uh, defined by the ones with the you know the, the printing press or the ones with the uh, with the authority. Right. Uh, we're seeing that in our world right now. Re a lot of rewriting of history right now to accommodate you know present thinking. And uh, and so if you if you go back to the beginning and if you ask if you ask the Catholic Church to to write your history and they and they do right. have, have their own you know they would say you know Peter was the first pope. Right. And the and and the, the term Catholic Church, the word Catholic means universal, right. and so if you say 
I believe in one holy Catholic church, small c, you mean one universal church, church triumphant, church universal. If you say capital C Catholic, you mean the actual um, church. The Roman you know, Catholic. The Roman Maybe Catholic church, started, yeah. Right. Uh, and so um, and so if you, if you uh, ask the Roman Catholic church, say, well, how did the church start? They would say, well, then, you know, Peter was the first pope, and they would start kind of looking at it through that lens. Now, Peter was a leader in the early church, but there's no, there's not, there's no sense historically that, that the role of the pope even existed at that point. Uh, but what's beautiful is when you read uh, the, the scriptures, particularly the, the, what's called the pastoral epistles, so First and Second Timothy and Titus, uh, those three New Testament books uh, give some of the clear structure at the beginning of the church. So mm -hmm. in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes upon this body of believers, the church is established, there's this beginning of this movement in the world with this mission, this love for Jesus, this gathering of God's people. Most of the early Christians were Jewish, and so they would, they would, um, they would go to celebrate Sabbath in the synagogue, but then they, would start, they started to celebrate the Lord's Day in the church. And many early Christians actually worshiped in the synagogue and in the church until, until around 70 AD, they were kicked out of the synagogues. There was a whole uh, dust up with, uh, with uh, a, uh, I won't get into that part of the history, but lots of conflict things that happened, and then and then there was persecution of Christians, but not so much of Jewish people, mm. and so uh, getting the Christians out of the synagogues uh, became sort of a thing. But the early Christians were comfortable in both environments, and then and then you know Lord's Day worship became the focal point point for Christians. Uh, but in, but in First, Second Timothy, and in Titus, it walks through kind of organizing churches, some structure for leadership, that there would be deacons, that there would be elders. Uh, that this is really members of the church who would get tend to the physical uh, material needs of people right. and leaders that would tend to the spiritual uh, and uh, kind of forward progression of their of their journey of growth. And and so it already in the first century, already as the Spirit of God was, was inspiring the words of Scripture, um, the Apostle Paul, who's planting, who was planting churches around the ancient world, is also writing to those churches saying, now that you have a, this ecclesia, this body, this gathering, a local church, um, you know, how do you handle conflict in the church? How do you handle leadership in the church? And all that, when you read the, 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 those letters to the churches, uh, you have to read it through the standpoint of these small gatherings that are this new thing that has never existed in the world before, in the sense of a, a community of people built around the teachings of Jesus. Uh, and also the Old Testament scriptures is part of that. And then at this time, the New Testament scriptures are being inspired and being penned. But, but um, so that there's this new work that's happening. So Paul's writing these churches say, saying, here's how to live. And sometimes he's responding. He'll say, it'll be, you can tell. They said, well, they wrote, said, well, what about this? How do we handle this? These people are fighting. This is going on. What do we do? And Paul would you know, write back and say, this is the proper way. And so mm -hmm. this is, this is the, the birth of a new thing. And, and then as the, as the church began to spread around the ancient world, uh, God strategically uh, moved the Apostle Paul and this, this t ministry team to plant in some of these areas that were right on these crossroads. Of, so, so the city of Thessalonica was right on a, a trade route by land and a trade route by sea. So if the gospel took root there and there were Christian churches there and people are traveling through to, to do commerce and business and while they're there, they learn of Jesus, they then take Jesus to the ends of the earth. And so that, there's that that kind of kind of the ancient internet or ancient right. you know spreading of the gospel. How do you spread the gospel? You 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 root a church and you root a movement of Christians in a place where people are traveling through and going all over the world. And that becomes the way that because there 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 was there was no real hub of communication other than voice to voice. Some some carrying of letters or things, but there wasn't a postal service. Right. There wasn't internet. I mean, it's hard for us to comprehend. Pony Express. And that was not a Pony Express in the in in, um, in the ancient Mediterranean world. Uh, there might I'm going to be guessing at that point, but I'm, I know there wasn't a Pony Express. That much I know. So yeah. All right. Um, where do I want to go from here? That's a lot of stuff. I know. I um, agree. So we talked about the Bible and having boundaries and guidelines for the church. Mm -hmm. How about how? Um, how we hear the church described? Maybe there's some imagery, some, mm -hmm. some metaphors yeah. Yeah. Uh, of the church uh, in the in the Bible. And yeah. Talk through those a little bit. What, is, what does the church look like? Yeah, mm -hmm. and 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 so and word pictures are powerful. Jesus used right. them a ton. The Apostle Paul used them, and so yeah, through the through the scriptures, um, and, and the, the term ecclesia is kind of kind of utilitarian, kind of practical. Right. It's a gathering. It's an assembly. Uh, it's something that the church that the, the, the church adopted uh, because they were the Christian assembly. Right. Uh, but the Apostle Paul would also talk about the church being like a body. So in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, uh, the idea that you're like a, like a physical body is bound together and connected uh, in every way possible 
so it is with Christ. Um, and, and so the idea of a body of which Christ is the head, Christ is the, is the, the one who guides, who leads, who directs us, but we are his arms, his feet, and, and so in 1 Corinthians 12 it talks about, you know, we're, we're like ears, we're like eyes, and, and, and the body wouldn't be beautiful, it was all one giant nose. Uh, it, it, it's all the parts functioning together. So, so what the Apostle Paul is communicating is that here's this word picture, like a physical body, so the church is connected. And you say, well, how connected? I, I would look and say, if somebody came to me and, uh, and said, hey, can I have the small, the pinky toe off your left foot? I've got these little, these little snippers right here, and uh, can I have it? I, I would say, absolutely not. And they say, well, it's, it's such a small part of you, you don't really notice it much, you don't use it for much. It's like, no, that's, right. that's part of me, right? right? And if, 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 um, if I were to lose, not somebody snipping up, but if I'm if I just walking along and, I, and I'm you know, wearing sandals and I jam that toe against a brick wall, uh, my teeth hurt, my Absolutely. ears hurt, every, your, your, every, your, your nervous system, everything. Why? Because we're connected. Paul's saying, that's, that's the church. We are that connected. Not just, not just Shoreline Church to each other, not just a local church, but the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. That we, we are one body. So we, we are that bound together with God's people all over the world. And this is one of the reasons why if you're a Christian who goes on a mission trip, you go to another part of the world, another part of the country, and you encounter other Bible-believing committed Christians, there's sort of feeling you're like, man, we, we're connected. That's that connection to the body. Then another image is the family of God. And again, that, that, you know, there's some churches will call, hey, hey, how you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? Right. Thomas, were you guys brothers and sisters in your church growing up? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you were brothers and sisters, right? <laughs> without, without fail, it was weird when we came to a non-denominational church that, they, that wasn't the case. They weren't, they weren't calling each other brother and sister. Yeah, so, the, so, so there's some churches that, that, that will lean into that more. Right. But I do have this profound sense that when I go to, so I had a chance to train a group of believers in El Salvador under this giant palapa, this big uh, kind of uh, just cover, you know, a roof covering with a bunch, with a bunch of um, palm branches and stuff right. over top of it. And so we're underneath that. I'm clarifying it because I use that term, I use the word palapa in, a, in a, something I wrote recently and I people, nobody knew, nobody knew what I meant. And so anyways, um, so I, a bunch of these people and, and as I was training them in, in organic outreach, how to share faith naturally, uh, I just kept looking at it and feeling like, this is family. Right. These are my brothers and sisters. And one day in heaven, we'll be together forever and ever. But we're, we're family even now. So, so we're a body, we are a family. And then another image that's used is the bride of Christ. Mm. And, and I've gotten in trouble for saying this before, but I'm, I'm just gonna say it again because I don't mind getting in trouble. Like trouble. But, yeah, uh, but the, the idea of the bride, um, I think it's, I, what I like to say is, it's interesting that, that the, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. And I said, one, I think one of the reasons is because the, the church is very optimistic about the, I mean, the Bible is very optimistic about the church, very positive about the church. So I always say brides are always beautiful. Brides are a moment. I mean, it's, it's the, the hair is fixed. There's a team of people working on them. Uh, if, if, you know, in, in a traditional wedding, right? Um, there, it's, it's like, this is the moment where you want to take the pictures because, you know, this, this might be, the high point, you know, right. uh, this might be this might be the best moment ever because every you know, everything's going towards this, and uh, and the, the church isn't called the wife of Christ. Now that doesn't mean a wife isn't beautiful, and it would be, but but there's, there's almost the idea of this idyllic view of that, that Jesus is the bridegroom, and the church is his beloved, mm-hmm. and this is one of the reasons why I I work hard to protect the church as a pastor. Um, I believe that Jesus looks at his church as his bride, and I know as a husband. If somebody were to come against come against my bride, it would be a problem. Right. And I think that Jesus looks at his church, and Jesus knows everything. He knows our frailties. He knows how we mess up. He knows that every person in the church that makes up the church is imperfect. That's why he came and died on the cross yeah. because of our imperfections. But he loves us anyways. And so, uh, so those 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 pictures and, and, and the people listening can do a, a deeper dive into each of those. But you know, some images of the church and think about this: a family. You know, meant to be a, a functional, healthy, loving family, right? right? A body all connected together, a beloved bride. That's that's an optimistic, positive look at this thing called the church. Right. And there are people people who say, "Well, I've been hurt by the church." They pull away from the church. Or, I don't like the church. I don't need the church. And and I would say, if you're a Christian, you may not always like the church, but you need the church, and the church needs you. We're, we belong to each other. And mm-hmm. so, just an encouragement to acknowledge. And and I think coming out of the whole this whole year of COVID and all that's happened, I you know. I, I enc- I'm encouraging Christians when, as soon as you're ready, reconnect within the body mm-hmm. of Christ. Be part of the assembly, part of the gathering, part of the church. Yes, churches are going to offer things online. If somebody is in severe risk of, of health issues, 
protect yourself, be careful. But I'm, I'm concerned that I think we're gonna have a lot of people who are just like, it's just easier to sit at home right. and not gather with God's people. And it's not the same. Not even close. It's not the same, not yeah. So I'm, I'm encouraging people to, so I'd say, I'd say to those listening to this, I would just say, listen, um, when you're ready, reconnect. I had five people last Sunday say to me, Pastor, it's my first time back in church. And they weren't saying it's the first time I've worshiped. They're saying it's first, my first time back together, together. And there was just, just they were beaming. Yeah. They were loving being there. And that's what I hope more people will experience soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you talked about the, the pictures of the church, and one of them you said was the family. Mm. And I think in my own family, and we have conflict. We have in my, in my family you know, times where we don't see eye to eye. We're not in agreement. Really? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and I know you work with Organic Outreach International yeah. and that work. You work with church leaders around the country and around the world and, and helping them. Have you ever had any times of conflict or maybe times where you've had to set boundaries or yeah. Uh, yeah. just difficult in that, you know? Well, we've even had people, groups, we, we've said we won't work with them. Oh, wow. Um, and and it's not, that's not been a behavioral thing uh, mm-hmm. in terms of, oh, they're, they're, just, they're just out of control. But I, like, I, had a, I had a person come to me. I was, I was speaking at an event in uh, Denver and or Colorado Springs. We flew to Denver, drove up to Colorado Springs, and was speaking at this event, and one of the other speakers was a national leader of an entire denomination. And I'm gonna, and out of kindness, I'm not gonna list right. the denomination, but they're part of a denomination. And uh, listen to what I was saying, I wanted to talk more about the idea of how to equip and train. Excuse me, I'm gonna go back on that one. <laughs> um, and, and in this case, the leader happened to be a woman, and she was talking to me about um, the vision for equipping and training leaders in the church to really do outreach. And she said, I, I would love to have you come and do some training with our leaders in our denomination. And I know the denomination and I know that they don't believe that Jesus, they're, they're universalistic. They don't believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Uh, they have compromised a lot of the core beliefs of the Christian faith. She was actually doctrinally sound and they had hired her to be in charge of evangelism for their denomination, not because of her doctrine, but because of her passion. Mm-hmm. But she was already bumping into some problems because she actually believed the gospel, believed in Jesus. And I, I looked at her and I thought, you're not going to last six months in this position because you're going to be offending everyone because you actually believe that Jesus is the way to heaven and the, their denomination as a whole doesn't. And so she said, do you think you could do some training and work with our leaders? And I said, well, I, and I tried to be, I didn't want to just go, no, uh, you guys have fallen off the deep end. I, and so I said to her, well, I said, my understanding is that your denomination as a whole doesn't believe that Jesus truly is the savior of the world and that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And she goes, yeah. She goes, I'm trying to figure that out. She, she came in from outside her own denomination. They brought, they hired her in. And I, I, just, I was feeling so bad as I'm listening to her because I thought I just could see the, the crash coming, oh, you know? Yeah. And she says, yeah. She says, as a matter of fact, I just did a training. It was actually in Texas where you think of anywhere you're going to have Christians. Or, she says, I did a training in Texas. And she said, after my training, I was training people how to share their faith and talk about Jesus and let people know that God loves them. And, and a group came up to her. She said, a group came up to me after the training and they said, you know, we, we don't know about all this stuff, and, but you know, d- do we have to use the J word when we're doing this? Stuff? Do we have to use the J word? And she, she said, I didn't know what they meant. I said, what, what do you mean the J word? They said, you know, Jesus. Do we have to use the J word? And I looked at her, I said, I said, so you have leaders in your denomination that you're training who are asking you if they have to even use the J word. She goes, yeah. And I said, so here's the thing. <laughs> I said, wow. um, when I come in to train leaders, it's training them to multiply what they're doing, mm-hmm. to reach more people with what they're all about. I said, and if the group isn't all about Jesus, why would I want to help them develop skills to multiply? They're, they're, they're going to multiply people that are not lifting up Jesus as Savior. And she goes, yeah. She said, that's a good, you know, she said, that's a good point. And I said, well, thank you. Uh, and, I, and I just said, can I pray for you? And I prayed, I said, Lord, will you help her figure out um, if she can be helpful in this denomination? Because I just thought, um, again, they hired her for her passion. And th- what, I think what they didn't realize was that she was gonna be uncompromising on the gospel, which means that she was gonna be pushing back against their own leaders. And, and if I was gonna figure out if the entire movement of this denomination was gonna win or this one new person coming in, I think the inertia of the, the movement was gonna actually push, kind of, kind of roll right over her. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, but I, and I said to her, well, I, said, I will pray for you, but I said, no, we, I, I would not make our resources available and I wouldn't come in and train people unless you really came to me and said, there's been a massive change and our leaders really believe in Orthodox historical Christian faith. Mm. Yeah. So you've, you've talked about how 
even denominations have split and there's mm-hmm. been changes and you've talked about some stylistic things you talked about the the how the church began in in the in the first century yeah. um, it, it makes me think that the church has evolved it yeah. has changed yeah. um, but also probably some things have stayed the same yeah um, how would you describe maybe some of the similarities from the early church to now over the last 2,000 mm-hmm. years or, or how things have changed over 2,000 yeah. years or maybe yeah. how they've stayed the same? What, yeah. I, that yeah. could be a, a whole podcast yeah. in and of itself, yeah. but maybe yeah. just a couple of points on that. I think it could be helpful. Yeah, I mean, the, the, church, the church is always changing because the world changes, but the, our doctrine shouldn't. So the foundation should stay, the foundation should be Jesus, the foundation should be the Word of God. A church isn't a church, church unless they actually hold to the scriptures and, and have core uh, beliefs. But individual congregations, styles come and go. There weren't mega churches even, you know, even 70 or 80 years ago, mm-hmm. really. There were sometimes in, the, revi- in the, the revival times where there'd be large gatherings, but regularly, regular ongoing gathers, gatherings. Uh, when, when Dwight L. Moody uh, in, was preaching in Chicago, um, they had a, you know, th- th- there were some large worship gatherings, but by and large, there weren't a lot of you know, really large churches. Mm-hmm. To, today, there are. But there also didn't used to be um, you know, large uh, stores. It was That's all true. mom and pop shops, right. and then the world began to change. And so, and, and now, now the mom and top, pop shops, many have gone away. You had large retail stores. Now those are going away as things are going online. Right. So the world changes, and I think along with it, the church changes. As long as our doctrines and beliefs don't change, the expression can change. I had a, a really interesting kind of case study in my journey as a Christian because the church, the church where I became a Christian was started uh, by a guy named Robert Schuler, and he started in a movie theater, very unconventional, and had a very real heart for reaching people that weren't part of the church. Event, eventually went from the movie theater into what they called the Arboretum. They built a building that had these giant, I mean like 30 foot tall glass doors that would slide open and he would preach outdoors to cars in the parking lot because he was mm. used to preaching in a movie theater, old, outdoor old movie theater. So he, and then indoor here, the first time I ever got up and spoke publicly was in that, in that room uh, on a Easter sunrise service where I did a 10 minute testimony. And, um, and so I became a Christian at this church that was started by Robert Schuler. Um, very evangelistic. They had about 10,000 people in, in worship. It went from being the Garden Grove Community Church. It became the Crystal Cathedral Congregation. They built this giant glass, um, lots of words, so just building. Yeah. Um, and that building and that property is now owned by the Catholic Church. Within his lifetime, this congregation started. They flourished and were thriving. They bought a large property, built a large building, built another large building, touched people all around the world, put on big Christmas programs, and did, you know, did um, it, some people would look at it and say, you know, that they would quest, question some of Schuler's uh, beliefs or how he taught or different things he did or if he was clear enough on the gospel. I know I became a Christian at the local church, not through the TV ministry, and the local mm-hmm. church was very biblical, very sound, very doctrinally sound. And But within his lifetime, that church was gone. And you go, okay, a lot changed in one lifetime right. from, from preaching on top of the snack shack at a drive-in movie theater to being in this giant glass building and every week having, I remember when Evil Knievel came and shared his testimony and he, that, he was like a big motorcycle daredevil guy right. when I was a kid, right? And, um, and, you know, and, and my life was impacted there. Mm-hmm. But that congregation, you know, that one local church doesn't exist anymore. And, I, and I've had people say to me, well, isn't that kind of sad? And my response is, well, it, it, this this particular local church really served its purpose in a season. I know probably 40, 50 people that are full-time in ministry who became Christians through that ministry, yeah, who are amazing. pastors preaching the word. So it still has an impact, but it's not about Bob Schuler's church. It's not about one local congregation. It's about the capital C church. And even though things change through history, um, the the church is still the body of Christ, is still the family of God, is still the bride of Jesus. The church is still triumphant and going forward. Um, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church will continue being the church. Um, in in the, some of the most persecuted parts of the world where the church is, where it's illegal to be a Christian, illegal to be part of the church, the church is thriving. Mm-hmm. And those Christians risk their life to gather and to worship and to pray and open the word of God. And so you go, man, it's, the, the church will keep being the church until Jesus returns again. And so I would say in terms of changes, 
the similarities through history are greater than the changes. Because if a church is a church, the similarities are what we believe, who we, we believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. The Apostle Paul gives kind of those parameters. And we believe in, in Jesus Christ. And so what, what a church is and who the people of God are, that really doesn't change. Right. Now, the shape and the style, um, that changes continually. And even right now, it's been, I, I love worship music, and so you know you, you can even watch in the modern church, you know, m- music going from the 1970s to Maranatha praise music kind of came out of Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, then Vineyard, the Vineyard churches, which was a church uh, planting movement, church starting movement, that became they started producing a lot of worship music. Um, then you go, you just kind of keep walking through that. You had Hill Hill Song in Australia that became mm-hmm. kind of, and that, and all you know, all those are still around. You can pull all those up on YouTube and listen to that music. And but then then you, you know, then you have you know individual congregations that are having a huge impact developing music. And there's lots of music that come out of elevation and and and. But now more recently, um, I, I'm trying to think, is it called Ma- Ma- uh, Maverick music or something like that? Uh, where where the, there's just there's more music coming out right now, more worship music right now than probably any time in history. And, but the style keeps changing, but it's not the style doesn't matter. It's the right. what's the heartbeat? What's is it pro- proclaiming the gospel? Is it lifting up Jesus? And so I would say, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Okay. And so over history, there's lots of changes in what the church might look like. But people are still people. So if you if you were to go to a local church in the first century, the tenth century, and in our century, and and if you were to really talk to people and say, what is the heartbeat of this church? What do you believe? If it's a Christian church, you're going to go, oh. They believe that salvation comes through Jesus, that Jesus lived and died and rose again, that he's the Savior, that he was God who came with us. You know, what are your practices? Oh, well, we worship together, and we try to help Christians grow, and we want to shine the light of Jesus into the world. And you, you say, oh, so why you gather, and the fact that you gather, and who you are, and how you live your life of faith is a lot more similar over, through history right. than, than it is different. But stylistically, things change. Mm-hmm. And so, and I think what, what we would probably see in the world now is there's probably more different styles and different options built around people's kind of personal tastes Mm -hmm. than there probably ever has been in history, Uh, which I, part of me that, part of me that makes me a little bit sad because it means that we're working really hard to cater to our desires and our likes Um, and really worship. I always say if worship is about anything other than God, it becomes idolatry. If worship is about me, it's certainly about idolatry Mm -hmm. because my focus isn't on God. It's on, am I getting what I want? And so I just, I challenge people that when, if you're part of a church, Serve, be faithful. You know, we haven't talked about the whole. To- we haven't talked about the whole topic of just how you know when you're part of a church, you're called to minister. What, you know, there's a past- There's pastors and leaders in the church, pastors and evangelists and teachers who equip all of God's saints for works of ministry. So everyone who's part of the church doesn't come to receive; they come to be part of the work of God in the world. Mm-hmm. And um, and what the church is doing in the world now and has done through history is glorious. I mean, the, the church continues to be uh, powerful all over the world, uh, and even in times where people look and say, "Well, there's." You know, you know, there's decrease in attendance or there's things aren't like what they used to be. When you get Christians together who love Jesus and believe the word of God, there is passion there. There's power there. Uh, there's glory to Jesus. There's help for believers. And there's a message to the world. And I, that's mm-hmm. what the church is, is supposed to be about. I love that. Yeah. That kind of leads me to where I think this kind of all ties in together. We've got this knowledge about the church and the history of the church and even some biblical guidelines and precepts about the church. Yeah. Um, but I, I love the application of it. Yeah. So what role should the church play yeah. in, in the Christian's life? So we, we have this knowledge now mm-hmm. about the church. Mm-hmm. How should that change our yeah. lives? What yeah. should our interaction yeah. be with, with yeah. the church? Yeah. Well, I would say a whole lot more than just an hour a week of going to a service. Yeah. Um, I think that the church should be a place of community for us. I don't think Christians should get overly locked into the church where they have no time for the world because we mm-hmm. have to be salt and light and bring God's love Amen. to the world. Absolutely. But um, there is something about being together with God's people of understanding that, man, I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. Um, that, you know, Committing to follow Jesus, whatever the cost, there's other people that are on that journey with me. And so um, you know, my encouragement would be you know, the, the value of the church, I think, is greater than most of us. It's, it's far greater than I can comprehend. Um, it's a place of community for believers. It's a place of learning and growth where we can get filled with God's teaching and God's truth. We can be around other Christians. Uh, we can have, you know, gain a common vision to bring God's love to the world. Um, it's a place where, in a, in a time where parents are going, how do I help my kids see 
what the truth is in this world that's just feeding them just all kinds of stuff that's just not only not only not true but is perverse and ungodly mm-hmm. and damaging and dangerous um you know find a church that's preaching the word find a church that has, that has great children's ministry student ministry it doesn't have to be a massive church but they have to be pouring into the next generation um and and so i i just feel like the 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 church exists to also to equip us for ministry mm-hmm. i tell i tell people that as a pastor far more than than me imparting you know wisdom to people it's challenging them to be who god wants them to be and so in, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, the different roles of leaders, and, and he talks about particularly pastors and teachers are to equip the saints, which is all of God's people, for works of ministry. And so one of my primary callings is to make sure that if I'm pastoring a church with 50 people, there's 50 people that would say, I'm a servant of Jesus, and I have a ministry to do. And if I'm a pastor of a church of 1,000 people, there's 1,000 people saying, I am a servant of Jesus, and there's ministry that God wants to do through me. He's gifted me, called me, and I know in my church I'll be equipped to live in this world for Jesus. What, however many people are part of the church, pastors and teachers are to help those people share in the work of ministry. And so, and then we also, the church exists that so we can gather and worship. Mm-hmm. And there's, and, and I love, I, I love worship music. And so I, I probably have worship music on when I'm working at my desk in my office, whether it's my home office or my church office, um, almost all the time. It's in the background, but it's there. But there's something different about a worship song when I'm alone and a worship song when I'm with other people. Absolutely. And, and not everyone resonates that same way, but for I, I think for, for many, many Christians, there's something about being together with God's people. There's something about learning the Word of God in community. Now, we should be opening up the Word on our own. We should be praising God on our own, but there's something about being together. And so that, that we'll circle back to the ecclesia, the gathering, the assembly. Uh, there's lots of reasons we should assemble because God calls us to, because it brings him glory, because it's where we can be equipped and trained. It's where we can have a common heart. It's where we can realize that we're not alone. Um, it's where uh, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, when one member suffers, all suffer with it. When one member rejoices, all rejoice with it. It's a place of, of you know, being honest about our hurts and pains and know that there's people supporting us in prayer, but also being able to share our greatest joys and have somebody go, I'm so happy I'm for you. With that, yeah. Instead of, well, isn't your little life wonderful? They go, man, I'm so, I rejoice with you. That's what the church does. It's a lot more than that, but that's kind of a, kind of a snapshot. I think that the practically to be engaged in a local Christian congregation is one of the smartest things any Christian can do. And to, to miss that and not do it is probably one of the most reckless things any Christian can do. So you pretty much have to be part of the local church to, to get what God would have for you in, in the Christian faith. Right. Yeah. You will you you will miss a lot if you don't. I'm not saying if somebody just doesn't engage in a local Christian church, they they aren't a Christian. I'm not saying they can't grow in faith. Right. But I would say that being engaged in a local church uh, sets you up for greater success and more rapid growth than not. And that's really what the Christian life is about, right? Becoming as much like Jesus as we can and following his example. Absolutely. Kevin, thank you very much for this today. I I know we just scratched the surface. There's so much more we could discuss about the church, but uh, but I appreciate the time. And there's more, but that's all I got. (laughs) All right. uh, Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Well, thank you. And thank you, Thomas. Thanks for tuning in. And whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more episodes as we release them. This is a weekly-ish podcast, so we will be putting out uh, episodes typically every Wednesday. So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss them.